Testing again. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? <laughs> this is crazy. This is not good. This is not good for business. This is not good for business. So let's try this again. All right. Um, let's get out of here. All right. So <laughs> I'm just getting it on with it here. So my apologies, everybody, as we uh, get started here again. Um, not sure what, what happened there. Um, good old internet. I could test. There we go. I can test everything the first time and then uh, see if it'll work. <coughs> or I can just, um, we can just scrap it and start all over again, which is not good for business. So uh, hopefully people get to, they can, they can find me, uh, they can get back in here and find me again. So, um, so listen, the, the point of today's talk, uh, for those of you that check in here, um, the, is, is one that I don't care if you're a football fan. Uh, I don't care if you're a Tom Brady fan or not. I don't care if you are a lacrosse player, a tennis player, uh, an equestrian athlete, a skier. That's really not the point. The point is, is that you should be a fan of athletes. Okay. And, and so one of the things that really bothers me a ton is when parents, especially when you talk about a competitor when we're going to use Tom Brady as an example today, but when you talk about a competitor, when you talk about another team, when you talk about living in one part of the country versus the other, and having a level of jealousy that really can undermine all of the athletic potential of your athlete. And so I, I was, as I was prepping for this, <laughs> not very welcome according to how my audio went. Uh, but when I was prepping for this, I, was thinking back to, to, to stories and ideas. And, and I thought back to one of the earliest athletes I ever worked with kind of in the, the, the work that I do at athlete specific.com and mental performance school and my athlete breakthrough blueprint program, all that stuff. Uh, one of my earliest athletes was a hockey player. And this hockey player was kind of always on the bubble. When I did a history of the athlete, I started to realize that no matter how this athlete however old this athlete was and whatever athlete, whatever um, teams he had played on, he was always on the bubble. Everything seemed to always seemed like a lot of work. And usually my first thought goes to an athlete who's not properly placed on the correct team. Okay. So, you know, if you're always playing up a level, right, it's going to seem difficult. Right. And that wasn't the case for this athlete. There was sometimes this athlete was like the captain of his team. There was other times when the athlete was not necessarily the captain, but was part of like the leadership was some of the older kids on the team. And, um, and so it was, um, it was interesting to do a little di diagnostic on this athlete and then only to find out. So I, I worked with this athlete for close to a year. And so basically the end of one season going into another season and most of the way through the second season. Um, and it got to the point where um, I, as we got to the kind of the end of our working relationship, there was really like, like a lot more I could help this athlete with, but I check in with the parents of my athletes fairly frequently. And this one athlete, I checked in with his dad and I had never talked to the dad. I had only talked to the mom and the mom had hired me primarily. And they, over the course of that amount of time, they pay, pay me a significant amount of money. And one thing that I tell all my athletes is, and, and a lot of coaches laugh when I say this, but we all can relate that, uh, as a coach, I work with your athlete a certain amount of time. You have that athlete as a parent a lot longer. <laughs> so some parents look to their coaches as a way to kind of fix, uh, to, to, to fix their, athlete and kind of fix their bad parenting. And what happened at the end here, as I finally got the chance to talk to the dad is I realized that, holy smokes, this, um, this dad's really negative, like really, really, really negative. And everything that when I talked to this, this dad, everything was like, Oh, how the grass was always greener sort of thing. And Oh, that, that athlete, uh, you know, the kid that bumped his kid, his athlete off the team, Oh, his dad had a insurance company or, um, or they grew, he goes to a better school or he, you know, if I had that much money, I could make all this happen. And, and so whatever it is. And I realized then and there that no matter what I was doing as a coach with their athlete and the progress that we were making, it was really getting undermined minded by 
the overall hating that this dad had of everybody else. And, uh, and I use the hating is probably not the best word there, but it's, it's appropriate in terms of as kind of in today's vernacular, this idea of like when you're hating on somebody else. Right. Uh, and so that really struck me and, and this weekend going into the Super Bowl and watching Tom Brady, who left the new England Patriots after like a bazillion years, he was like 19 years where he had won six Super Bowls and then, and had been in nine Super Bowls. And then he then left New England, goes to Tampa Bay, where last year their team had gone like five, uh, what was it seven and nine the year before? And they flip it around, they go like 11 and five this year, and they, and they go to the Super Bowl and they win. And, and the hate towards Tom Brady is pretty amazing. And what I find interesting is that, is that there's always a really big undercurrent of people who hate success. One of the things I tell all the parents who I work with, a lot of the parents that come to me are, you know, they, they are, I want to say above average in terms of means, you know, they are successful people the, some t- the, even, even the ones that are like blue collar, they are, they are um, successful of mind and the athletes who, uh, uh, so, so having resources did not, does not necessarily make you give you the people think it gives you the best opportunity to be successful. And that's not always the case. Like I've worked with the, the athletes of billionaires. I've also worked with the athletes of people who are just like everyday blue collar worker. Um, and we all know that there's nothing wrong with being a billionaire. Like it's just, uh, we just can't, uh, sorry, I, that joke falls flat on a lot of people. But the point is, is that, is that I've had, athletes who are come from tremendous means who are unsuccessful. I've had athletes who've come from from tremendous means who are successful. I've had athletes who come from no means who are successful. And so uh, one of the stories I, uh, that I think back on that re- resonates with me that may not resonate with you, but when I compete in the sport of luge, like, and I know luge is very obscure to a lot of people and it may not really um, make a lot of sense uh, to, um, to a lot of y'all and, and, but, but the, the most dominant team when I was competing was the German women and the German women were, uh, they had this ridiculous winning streak, like this mind bogging, bog, bogglingly long winning streak. And I, and I can't remember what it was. It was like, God, it was over years. They won every single world cup. Like, and then they won world championships and they won Olympic medals. And then and a lot of times in those races, they swept those medals. And what happens, what happened during that time was this attitude amongst the other athletes from the other countries. And this included our American women was that, was that they, they were waiting for just those Germans to all quit so they could have their turn to win. And I want to, um, I want to be the, how about the athletes of firefighters? This is ultra, also true, Chris, I see you there. Um, but when you are in this attitude of like your competitor is lucky or wouldn't it be nice or, you know, oh, oh yeah, he's got a model wife. It, all life would be great. That's not necessarily true those the we we all come at these things with our with our own unique um with our own unique challenges and one of the things that is desperately obvious when you interview successful athletes across all sports there's a great study down in new zealand um where they interview they've interviewed like thousands of of new zealand olympians and they've they've interviewed the Olympians, and they've also interviewed the medalists. And one of the things that's really ob- obvious, even amongst the medalists, is the struggles that they face are, they're very human. Like, so we tend to put athletes on pedestals and we think, oh my God, wouldn't it be great if I was like that? And well, not necessarily because they struggle with the same things you struggle with. And so I want to basically implore all the parents who may be listening to me now or later on, on YouTube or on the podcast or whatnot, and realize that that 
your ability to humanize your athlete and the struggles they go through and the struggles you may be going through as a family, uh, financial or otherwise, are such that everybody deals with them. And this year at the Super Bowl, like, you know, Tom Brady, one year his mom overcame cancer uh, right before the Super Bowl. This year, both his parents had COVID um, and then therefore had to deal with all this stuff. And again, people think like, oh, if I had all that money, I'd be able to survive that too. Eh, not necessarily. Okay. So, so this year, what was kind of fascinating to me was, I'm going to try to get some photos open here, was, um, so... Tom Brady wins his, uh, this is, this has got to be an old, oh, he wins his fifth, fifth Super Bowl MVP award. So, um, you can't have, uh, you can't have the, uh, a jealous mindset of your competitors or somebody else or like an athlete like this. And also it in turn have the ability to seek out all the things that you can glean or your athlete can glean from that example. Okay. So what I mean by that is that there's a lot of people who will look at their competitor and say, Oh, if I was at that school and I had that gym or that field or that weight room or that coach, I would be just like those other, those athletes on that team. Okay. And that's not true. Uh, you, you just can't have that jealousy and be adop ad adopting an attitude that's going to allow you to be successful where you are. Last year, for example, one of my athletes in lacrosse goalie university, uh, a lot of you guys know that I work with a lot of lacrosse goalies and a lot of hockey goalies is that, um, I, uh, I had an athlete who became an all American who grew up in a condo with no backyard. And one thing is I always tell people is like all Americans are made in the backyard. And I really believe that like all, you know, all Americans, Olympians, they're made in the little spots. They're made in, in the basements, in the backyards, in the garages, like now with, because of COVID it's going to be all it's, it's all over the place. But people think that, Oh my God, I've got to have this elaborate thing in order to be successful. I've got to have this massive backyard or this massive, um, uh, I've got to have access to a strength coach or a weight room, whatever. The truth is, is that you can look at any, any, whatever sport you're in, you can look, your athlete can find, and, and you as a parent can find people who have done more with less. Okay. So people who have done more with less. And one of the stories that came out of this weekend, which I find really, really fascinating if, for those of you that don't follow, fo follow football is that on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers team, there's Tom Brady who grew up in California, who played football at, you know, one, at a top school in California, who then went to Michigan where he backed up. Uh, he didn't start right away. He was picked very famously 199th in the, um, uh, yeah, 199th in the um, um, sorry in the draft. So that basically last, and and then went on to become the greatest, uh, like the greatest football player in history, and arguably one of the greatest, um, one of the greatest athletes in history. So the, the the interesting thing about when you get to this level that he's at is you're not just being the best in your sport; you're being the best across all sports are so like Michael Jordan in basketball or Le LeBron James, um, or you go into baseball and you start looking for the, you know, the greatest baseball players in history. This, these are, or, or tennis, Roger Fer Federer, F1, Lewis Hamilton, um, wherever you want to look, there are examples of now where he's gone on to become the greatest ever. Now, what's really interesting, I'm going to try to pull this up if I can, um, is that, on the same field with Tom Brady, on the same team, is an athlete named Mike Evans. And Mike Evans grew up with a, um, so at the age of nine, his father was killed in homicide. And the he was killed, though, by his brother. So Mike Evans, Mike Evans, you know, obviously loves his dad and then also loves his uncle. 
And then his uncle goes and kills his dad. So just a crazy twisted story. But Mike Evans could have taken that story and ended up in prison like a lot of kids would. However, he turned things around and ended up being on the same Super Bowl team as Tom Brady. Uh, another player who was on the opposing team uh, for the Kansas City Chiefs, a guy named Tyron, uh, Tyron Matthew, uh, went to prison either before college or after college, I can't remember which it was. Basically, his 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 inmate buddies in prison said, like, you've got to get your life together. And he turned it around and then became one of the best football players currently in the league. So it's really, you know, it's, I share those stories, not to share like tragic stories, but just to share you like that people from different backgrounds come from, come to the same result, no matter what the sport is, whether you're trying to make a high school team or make a college team or play the Olympics, or play, play, play pro someone out, out there who has less has dealt with less is, um, is dealing with, um, is dealing with, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, they're having trouble just like you. Okay. Again, very human stories or worse. Okay. Now I'm trying to get this. I'm going to try to pull this up for you because this is kind of cool. Um, actually I'm not, I don't think I'm gonna be able to. Hello. There we go. All right. This, I posted this on Instagram today. If you don't follow me on Instagram, check out Olympic Jonathan on Instagram. This was a graphic that played during the, um, during the Super Bowl, And so this was a, these were High school, um, uh, for those of you who have the athletes in high school sports, there's always this massive, uh, there's always this massive, um, obviously, like, where's my kid ranked? You know, oh, I'm in Florida, but our team, you know, our club team is ranked like ninth in the country. Isn't this amazing? Not necessarily. Right. So if you see, so, and then what ends up happening is there's jealousy to all those kids that are like the top ranked kids in the country. This is a really cool stat. And it basically shows that. On the Kansas City Chiefs, on the two teams that played in the Super Bowl, of all the kids that came out of high school, and out of, uh, there was one kid who was a five-star recruit, right? So if your kid is not a five-star recruit, a lot of people think like, oh my God, this is never going to work for me. Uh, Kansas City had 12 four-star uh, four recruits. Tampa Bay had eight. Kansas City had 10 three-star recruits. At that point, you're kind of going like, why are we counting stars? And... Uh, Tampa Bay had 12, but the, the bottom, this, unfortunately this is covered by the graphic uh, that I, I put up there. It was this dude like looking right, like going, huh? Is that on the Kansas City chief, 19 of their players did not come out of high school ranked at all. And Tampa Bay, the team that won the Super Bowl, had 22 people, right? That's close to half your roster, right? 53 man roster. That's just barely, just under half. So, so, what I want, the reason why I share this with you is because I want you to understand that wherever your athlete is right now, wherever you are right now, does not need to be a limiting factor, right? From the ultimate goal of being a really great athlete within your sport. And I say this again and again, that when you can focus on just being the best damn athlete you can be, then a lot of the issues that you have as an athlete tend to go away a lot of the headaches. So just like that hockey player I had the, while I, I didn't work with him after this phone call I had with the dad, not because of the phone call, but it's just kind of the end of the, the run. I told this dad, I said, listen, you have to eliminate, you have to eliminate negative talk against your competitors, against your son's competitors. And one of the things that I encouraged this dad to do was to really double down on his own goals. Um, um, and I think that what for this dad in particular, I said, Hey, listen, I want you to, I want you to turn and I want you to find out. Now this guy wasn't, he had his own business. I said, listen, I want you to double down on your own business. And instead of looking at your competitors with disdain and, and, and lack of trust and whatever, uh, or, or jealousy that, Oh, wouldn't it be nice to just take a hundred percent responsibility for where you're at. And this is, I wrote about this in my book in an athlete's guide to winning in sports and life that I, the first thing that comes down to everything is, is taking a hundred percent responsibility. Now that leads me to a question here. Pinky one Oh two five on Twitch writes, Hey, just joined, but I don't hate on Tom. I just think the game was BS with all of the flags. Okay. So, so, Pinky1025 on Twitch, uh, great 
points. So for those of you guys that might not have watched the game, like in the first half, especially there were a lot of really bad penalties. There were, there were a lot of penalties. Some were considered like, Hey, the, the refs should just let them play. Others though were pretty blatant mistakes, like lining up in the neutral zone offsides, uh, some taunting penalties. Um, there were some uh, holding penalties. Uh, and in the first half, it seemed like it went both ways at the end of the game though, even the Kansas city players said, Listen, it wasn't the penalties, right? It wasn't the penalties. They they realized that while they made it, they might have felt a little bit under under the gun in the first half. That by the second half, when they hadn't scored a touchdown, that maybe it was how they played. And even Coach Andy Reid, who's ironic, well, not ironically, but his son, who's on their coaching staff, got into a DUI two days before the Super Bowl. He said, "Like, listen, I didn't do a good enough job." So. Pinky, well, I appreciate that. As a fan, you might go like, oh, this sucks. This is horrible. That was not – those athletes on the field will tell you that even with penalties, you have to then double down and go, it's on us. We've got to be better. And that's that's how. Because, again, another thing I wrote about my book was this idea that, that, that we – you know, teams, athletes will complain about a penalty as like this critical factor. But there are – thousands hundreds you know millions of tiny plays that happened prior to that that would have changed the course of the game very famously there's a story about a a, a, a computer uh, I, i'd never get this story right exactly but the bottom line is this the when you watch like weather forecasts and they show that um they show that oh like there's going to be you know a hurricane on the east coast very famously, there was a study done, or there was a in the computer uh, algorithm that for, that forecasted what was up with the, the, the this weather forecast. They made a, they, they made a mistake, like by like you know a, a millionth of a decimal or something, the equivalent of a butterfly wing, like a, a flap of a butterfly wing on the west coast, can change the outcome of a hurricane on the east coast. And I like that analogy because, especially fans that watch games and they get wrapped up in the commentary they can also start to go down the trail like, oh, like if those penalties didn't happen, they would have won the game. I don't think so. All right. I don't think so. And that again is, is it's, it's a little bit what we're talking about here. This idea of like, oh, these things that are kind of out of my control, I'm blaming on the result. And this is where a lot of parents do this. They sit on the sideline and they yell at the ref or whoever, whatever, or they bitch about the coach or the, um, who knows what. And so what they're doing is they're basically teaching their athlete to look outside of themselves for the answer when in fact all the answers are inside. Now, one of the things that I find really fascinating because I love watching the NFL is that the uh, the commentary around sport, what I mean by that is the commentary like when you're watching the game on TV and you're listening to the two guys talking about it, we get a lot of what I call middle class thinking. We get uh, so f- now on NFL Network, they're playing like all of Tampa's like previous games leading up to the Super Bowl. And uh, Tampa played Atlanta, and Atlanta was supposed to win. And they, pa- um, so uh, for those of you guys that don't know, so this is Rob Gronkowski. So, um, so Tom Brady made, made a pass to Rob Gronkowski, who also used to pay, play with the New England Patriots, and he makes this beautiful catch and he runs in and the commentator and i can't remember his name the color guy said it's just so unfair and it what i want you to understand is that words matter right so as an athlete words matter and one of the most famous studies of athletes done basically when they boil down to one of the one of the traits of elite athletes is that they want to be told the truth of where they are. So if they're, if they suck, they want to be told that they suck. This is of elite athletes. This not be, this may not be the case of your athlete or you as a parent, uh, you might not like to hear this, right? And then this happens a lot. Like a coach tells an athlete like, Hey, you're too fat. And people get all upset. Like it's like fat shaming. Now that's a problem, right? If a coach says you're too slow or you don't work out enough or you're, you're, you know, you gotta, 
you've got to get your grades up or any of these things or your habits are wrong. People tend to take that personally, but elite athletes go, where's the truth in that and what can I improve on? And so for that parent that I was working with who had the son who was the hockey player, as we talked, he even said like in his own life, he was not one to do that. He was not one to take the information given him and then to turn it around and really apply it. Uh, ironically, this man had been divorced twice. <laughs> so what do you think that says? Um, so, so when you listen to sporting events, I actually encourage my athletes not to like, I want you to watch sporting events, but I don't necessarily want you to listen to the commentary unless it's excellent. And in the Super Bowl, Tony Romo, who was a former NFL quarterback is like mind blowingly excellent. And when he, when he describes what's going on, because he may say like, Oh, you know, Jim Nance may say like, Oh, it looks so unfair, but Tony Romo will then take the, the, the approach and say like, well, this is how you stop him. And that's the attitude you have to take as a parent and your athlete then has to take. And your athlete is impacted by the parent, I would say almost more than the coach, right? And so what, what happens is that if your athlete is looking at a game and uh, the parent goes, oh yeah, well, wouldn't that be nice? Well, now your athlete has to overcome that level of thinking, right? That negativity. And what's weird there is because there's always a level of respect between an athlete and their parent, even if the parent is wrong. And that's what's really interesting about sport is that as an athlete, you can work with a coach and the coach can say like, all right, like this is the way we got to think about this. That athlete can go home and mom or dad goes, yeah, yeah, that's not true. And now your athlete is torn between the two. So this is why I always encourage that there's a communication line between the parent and the coach so that the parent can now be involved and hopefully not sub like basically submarine the input from the coach. Cause when that happens, the whole thing falls apart, right? It's a lot of, a lot of these gymnastic stories that get really, they go really bad. Um, uh, that's what happens. The coach tells an athlete, this is what I think you need to work on. Athlete tells the parent, parent goes, that coach is full of it and the whole thing falls apart. And instead of the coach or the athlete going to, to the coach and saying, Hey, what, you know, what's the deal? Why are you saying that? I disagree. They just like either stay and pout and, and blow it up or, and, and not leave, or they should leave and find another coach. Now, hopefully they go to another coach. And if the first coach was good, the second coach says the same thing. And the parent goes, oh, okay, I guess we need to make a change then, All right? But if the parent is just sitting there going like, oh, I would just wish we were with that other club or that other club is so good or that other club has better jerseys or that other club, they've got better orange wedges at halftime, like whatever it is, if you put that into your athlete's head, your athlete is not going onto the field of play with confidence, okay? So, so what I encourage people to do with all this, all right, is you have to dissect, right? So when you look at someone like Tom Brady or anyone else, you have to dissect their performance. Now, what's really funny and interesting is that Tom Brady, right? So, so where to put it? Um, I have his book. I have his TB12 book somewhere around here. Where is it? And I probably won't be able to find it now. But uh, no, maybe not. All right. Of all the books that are immediately behind me, it's in the bookshelf that's over there. So I won't bother. But um, so you can look and see what he does for training, right? You can see, you can start to dissect. And, and with the internet, you can peel apart pretty much all your competitors and see what it is they're, they're doing or the coaches that they work with. And then you can find the coaches' websites and find out what they say about training. And, and the coaches' websites will reference the people that they taught to. You've got to become a student of the game and you've got to become obsessed about this. And you will be obsessed about something, okay? You may be obsessed about getting a lot of sleep. You may be obsessed about, you know, staying up to date on your for you page on TikTok, right? You may be obsessed about um, like the office or how I met your mother videos or Mandalorian. You're obsessed about something. Now, what's really interesting is that you, your sporting pursuits, your athletic pursuits need to have a level of a certain percentage of your obsession. 
Okay. And so today I had a, a discussion with one of my, the parents of one of my athletes, and I was recommending that this athlete spend, focus more on their strength and conditioning. And the, the dad was like, I totally get it. But my, my athlete is, right now is unfortunately focused, uh, unfortunately is focused on academics. I said, okay, that's fine. That's the trade-off that you will make. Okay. So Tom Brady very famously now eats like avocado ice cream. Interesting. Do you like avocado ice cream? Do you think it directly relates to Tom Brady's performance on the field of play? Do you think it would relate to your performance? Possibly. Or maybe not avocado ice cream, but some other th choice, right? Because really, it's not about the avocado ice cream that people like to dwell on. It's about the ultimate choices that he makes to now be a an athlete who takes care of his body and who is trying to play for now for as long as possible. He'll probably play till he's like 50. You know, he's 43 right now. And that's awesome, right? And so we all make those choices. We all make those trade-offs, right? We always make those trade-offs between basically our values and performance, right? So just like my athlete who's decided like, hey, right now I got to focus on school. I can't put in that time into the strength conditioning work. Well, only until later will you know if that was the right choice or not, okay? Because... And usually by then it's too late. You wish you had done it sooner, right? And a problem that a lot of our athletes have, heck, a lot of people have, right? We all have this, is that when you put in the time and effort and energy on an activity, a task, a habit uh, that does not have an immediate payoff, okay? We are very short-term thinkers, especially in the United States and Canada, right? We want to see like immediate results. And even if we, you know, if avocado ice cream is the thing, then, and we have it today and it tastes horrible, we'll just throw it, we'll just, say, forget it. I'm not doing that. Instead of sticking to that long-term vision of, of being, you know, an athlete who can play year after year after year, way until, you know, for Tom Brady, way until his late forties. Right. And so what's really fascinating is that people look at him and go like, Oh my God, he's so obsessed. Well, you're obsessed too, right? You're obsessed about something. Okay. And it's really important that you decide like you're either valuing this thing in your life or you're valuing this thing in your life. Okay. Now, where a lot of parents get in the way here, okay, is their athlete has been like gifted, blessed, cursed, however you want to put it. And they're told that, you know, they have this idea for their sport, like they want to be a division one athlete or they want to be an Olympian. And mom or dad maybe did or didn't have that, maybe didn't have that same dream when they were young. So they can't necessarily relate to it. So what happens a lot of times is they go like, well, that's nice. That's great. But, and they, they doubt the, they doubt the potential within their athlete. Okay. Now that is, is a very active form of submarining your athlete. And what's crazy is that parents will throw incredible amounts of time, energy, and money, right? Resources into this activity, as opposed to looking at it and going, all right, this is what we're going to do. Okay. You want to do that? It's, it's, then we need to do X, Y, and Z. It's like, you want to go to Harvard? Okay. This, and you would map out that plan, right? And there's people who do this, right? You map out that plan and you spend, and you, you allocate the time, energy, and money that you feel is, that, that is appropriate, right? And for a lot of families, they're breaking the bank on it. Okay. And that's, again, that's your choice, not, not anybody else's, right? And so if your family doesn't put that to it, that's okay. Because just like that story about Mike Evans, who grew up, you know, losing his dad and his mom wasn't around and 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 his, his uncle's gone, you know, of all the people that shouldn't make their dream come true, it's that kid. So you have to compare yourself against that experience, right? That, that athlete, okay? You, you can never... As athletes, we're always comparing ourselves, right? It's what we do. We go, like I always say, we are as an athlete, our job is to go out into practice on a game day and to embarrass ourselves and swear that we're never going to let that happen again. Okay. So, so what I mean by that is like you go out to practice, you may fall on your face, you may miss a pass, you may fall off your horse, right? You may crash into the nets and skiing, whatever it is, right? It's embarrassing. So, but you learn from it and you go back and you go like, I'm never going to do that again. So here's how I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and then I'm going to try it again. 
And then sure enough, it's going to work, right? And you're going to do that all the way until the point where the sport tells you, you can't do this anymore, or you decide that you're done. Okay. But the idea here is when you compare is that you, you don't want to compare yourself negatively, like too, too negatively. Like, I, like obviously if you're not winning, everything is negative, right? A lot of people forget this. Like if you don't win a race, well, everybody else just lost. But along the way, everybody has had some sort of learning experience. You know, what I love in the sport of speed skating, especially here in Calgary, Alberta, is that when you, when you, when they race, right, they race in pairs. And so the faster pairs go towards the end of the race. And so what happens is the times get faster and faster and faster. But as you get close to the end, what happens is even if you don't win the race, like, so you you finish with a time and it'll say, it'll tell everybody, like it's in the computer, what your personal best is. And if you beat your personal best, that'll come up on the scoreboard and everybody will cheer. Like the entire stadium will cheer just like you won a medal. Okay. Now, if you break a world record, record, right, then people are going to cheer like crazy, but they reward the personal best. So I want to make sure that you as a parent listening to me are helping your athlete basically compare themselves against themselves, right? So, so unless you're winning all the time, <clears throat> you're, you're going to be in some sort of a negative state and, but you don't want to get too negative. You don't want to go like, oh my God, I lost by a hundredth of a second. This whole, the whole world sucks. I quit. Right. Cause that's really, that's not what we want to be. That's not the headspace we really want to be in. But a lot of parents will get stuck in that headspace. They'll go like, oh, well, you lost. Uh, let's go for some McDonald's. Right. Um, but so I, you got to compare, but ideally you're comparing to yourself and then comparing to the vision that you want to, to, to have in your sport. Now that's what's really kind of fascinating here is that is that as an athlete, every sport, and for those of you that are parent age, you understand, and you've watched sports long enough, you'll know that you know every couple generations, there's some transcendent athlete. And I can guarantee you that, that their parent did not think of them as a transcendent athlete <laughs> at the time, right? Um, I had a lacrosse player years ago who, who I got a chance to coach and help them through their recruiting process. And the mother was just like, couldn't believe her son was would be wanted by any coach at that level because his room was a mess he played too much xbox and he wouldn't take out the trash how could anybody want this kid like she just couldn't see that and it was like oh okay uh you gotta you gotta like get out of your bubble a little bit and realize like hey there's other things going on here. And it was crazy because I had to talk to like the husband and go like, yo, this is not good. Like if mom's thinking like this all the time, she's just sucking the life out of her son. Right. And uh, luckily that it didn't affect him too much. So that was good. But you've got to be, um, you got to be mindful of that. One of the terms I can't stand is the term of must be nice. Right. When people say like, oh, must be nice. They, uh, as I mentioned early, earlier, the idea here is that when you say, oh, it must be nice, what you're basically saying is my experience is crap. Like, the, you know, the experience I'm dealing with can't possibly help me become an, you know, an Olympian or, or reach my goals. But if it does, that's, that'll be great. But, but I'm not really feeling like it does. That's a not good, not a good place to be either. Um, one of the things I'll share with this, I'll try to get this up on the graph on the V I had this up on there it is. Uh, so a couple of years ago, uh, I had a chance. We were trying to put a, um, a strength, and strength and conditioning f uh, facility in this tennis center that I'm bringing up online. It's called the Austin and Victor Alberta tennis center. And, uh, sorry, the, uh, the graphic is a little bit, um, let me see if I can repeal this. Hold on. Add source screen capture, smart capture. Boom. I'll just make this a better size. So you guys can see it better. Uh, boom, boom, boom. That's better. And my face. Boom, 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 boom. All right. So this was a. Uh, this is the Austin and Victor Tennis Center in in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and, and I think it was like six or seven million dollars to build. Uh, it's on this little chunk of land, and uh, and it's beautiful, 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 and uh, it has like you know a couple of these courts have like digitized. Uh, 
like there's cameras all over it to digitize every serve, every ball, the spin on the ball. Uh, like it basically can give all sorts of feedback that you could possibly think to give to an athlete. And while I was there, a presentation was done to, to these athletes by a sports psychologist and who will rena- remain nameless. And he said, uh, yeah, this play site, smart court stuff, just nuts. Um, he was like, this, this facility is too good. And you're thinking like, what? Uh, like, yeah, this facility is too good. And he told the story. Yeah, it has like a coffee bar. It's got like a Starbucks in it. It's got a cafeteria. It's uh, it's uh, yeah, like little yeah. It's 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 nuts. It's beautiful, 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 beautiful. But I agree with that that sports psych to a degree that um, it doesn't always mean it's the best place to be. It's the best place to play, or that out of this place will come professional tennis players. And I share with you the story of Novak Djokovic, who is one of the greatest lacrosse or greatest tennis players um, currently playing. He'll be one of the greatest tennis players in history when he's done, but he was discovered playing as a young boy in a dried out pool in Serbia, I think Serbia. And he was discovered by a German woman who happened to have been a tennis coach in Germany when she was younger. And she took Novak under his belt and they practiced, you know, in this pool, they practiced wherever they could. And Serbia at the time was a pretty much a war torn country. Um, And he went on and became, you know, one of the greatest tennis players of all time. Now, along the way, there are sponsors involved. There's people who, who are interested and want to basically take an athlete like that under their wing. And if that is your athlete, then you need to help seek those things out. It's part of the game, right? If you want to work with someone like me, or you want to work with a coach nearby and and you don't have the ability to pay cash for it, there's other ways to make this work, but great athletes find a way to win and winners keep winning. And that's true for Tom Brady. That's true for Usain Bolt. That's true for your favorite athlete who has probably been playing for a very long time. It's really interesting right now. After the Super Bowl this weekend, there's talk of the quarterback on the other team, Patrick Mahomes, who's quite young. Um, He could actually be Tom Brady's son. (laughs) Uh, He won the Super Bowl last year and the MVP. This year, they were like, this is the GOAT, Tom Brady. This is like Yoda playing baby Yoda. That's what people are saying. And when he lost, people started to say like, oh my God, what if he's done? What if he never makes it? And I was just like, shut up, people. Like, shut up, shut up. And that is the middle class think that perpetuates sports. And when you watch sports and you hear the commentators putting these stories out like, oh, this is unfair or you know, oh, the, the refs are biased or this or that, like whatever. You should watch the games without the commentary. And, and a lot of times I wish you could just turn on like crowd noise versus, you know, the commentary would be a hell of a lot more interesting. The point is, is that I want to leave you today with this understanding of if you find yourself as an athletic parent or an athlete themselves, being jealous of the other side, the other team, the other resources, the other coach. Right, I had a coach, a strength and conditioning coach, that said the best program is the one that you're not on. I would add to you the best club team is the club team you are not on. The best coach is the coach that you don't have. The best piece of equipment is the piece of equipment you don't have. And so on and so on and so on. It never ends. And you've just got to be the best with what you have. Right, You've got to take You've got to prove to yourself that you can be the best with what you have before you can really value the next piece of equipment or the next team or the next ski hill or whatever, you know, the next horse, you know, I I deal with, I work with some equestrian athletes over the years. And what's fascinating to me is that, is that uh, in certain events, well, in a lot of events, it's like, if you have a bigger, stronger horse, you should do better. But what's fascinating is that you need the ability to control that horse. And some athletes don't. 
And every year athletes die in that sport because they're unable to control that larger horse and they get thrown off or they get what's called spiraled. Like the, the, the horse does basically a somersault over a, a jump and the athlete gets landed on. Uh, and, you know, having a couple you know, thousand pounds land on your back uh, is not good for business. So, so, but I share that story with you because it's just, it's just another example of like, oh, the, the, if I have a better horse, I'll be better. Right. So it's a never ending spiral. So, but as the parent, I don't watch, it's funny because as parents will say like, listen, I'm not getting you new equipment until, you know, you prove this to me. But the flip side is the same parent will go like, oh, must, must be nice to be that athlete or that coach or that team or whatever. Right. So it's kind of funny because those, I can guarantee this, those coaches and those parents are saying the same damn thing. Okay. So I will leave you with that. Chris Kunkel, thanks for the question. I apologize for the audio at the beginning, although those of you guys listening to me now will not have heard those audio issues. Uh, Pinky1025, thanks for the great question. Mark Copen, I see you. Mac, Matt Harris, I see you. Mac Edwards, I see you. Lunati, I see you. And everybody else who's on and gave me some comments before you left. I really appreciate it. Uh, I will see you guys next week. All right. If, uh, But again, just a quick little pitch. Check out athletespecific.com. Get on our newsletter over there. I'm sending emails now kind of weekly again. I wasn't doing it for a while. But uh, if you want more information like this, if you want me to answer a question, please don't hesitate to ask Coach Edwards at athletespecific.com. And I'll see you next week. Cheers.